uh, introduce our guest. Um, Dr. Kara Polin is currently the lead physician at Spectrum Health Medical Group Center for Integrative Medicine. She's the president of the Michigan Society of Addictive Medicine and serves as the secretary treasurer for the Midwest Society of General Internal Medicine. She is currently a faculty member at MSU and has taught at Central Michigan and Boston University as well. Dr. Poland received her medical degree from Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit and was fellowship trained at Boston University in addiction medicine specifically. She's board certified in both internal medicine and addiction medicine. She's an accomplished researcher, teacher, presenter, and committee member. Today she's gonna to give us some of her perspectives on the challenges of treating those at-risk, uh, chronically complex patients and the advantages of an integrated kind of care approach in line with what we've been talking about today. So with that, I will be quiet and invite Dr. Poland to the stage, thank you. Hi, I'm gonna bring that down because I'm just gigantic. Um, I made it over five feet. That was always the goal in my life. My husband's 6'4". Um, <laughs> those are the facts for the morning. Um, the rest of it's gonna be smooth sailing if you can keep track of that. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. I hope I cover what is expected of me. We might go there a little bit circuitously. So hang in there for the beginning parts and we're gonna have a little bit of fun. So I titled, oops, I titled this No One Wants to Do That because that's usually what people tell me when I tell them I'm an addiction doctor. Why would you want to do that? And I get this look of like perplexion. Like who deals with those people? I love them. It is the most fun and they're the most fascinating group of people. And we get to make such amazing changes in people's lives that I, have, that I did not experience anywhere else in medicine. So that's why I do what I do. Um, that brings me to our agenda for today. They asked me to kind of explain how I ended up where I am. And like anyone else, I had the 10-year plan and the 15-year plan and the 20-year plan when I started medical school. None of it became what I did. Um, I don't know if anybody noticed, but I don't have any hair. I have a condition called alopecia. It's categorized as a dermatologic condition. I developed alopecia when I was five years old. I decided when I was seven years old, I was gonna be a dermatologist. My grandfather asked me if I wanted to become a lawyer like my father, and I had told him that I was already committed to dermatology. <laughs> um, you know, that wasn't quite where I ended up in life, but that's okay. Um, I did end up going to medical school, and I did think I was still going to go into dermatology as a 20, 22-year-old student. Um, I went to the Cleveland Clinic and got a letter of recommendation from the current president of the American Academy of um, Dermatopathology and the past president of the American Academy of Dermatology that said, we would love to have her as a resident here at Cleveland Clinic. Like, golden ticket. Dermatology is one of the hardest specialties to get into. Problem was, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> Took me until I was 22 to figure it out, but I hated it. At least I figured it out. Um, I then ended up getting assigned, I was already in this process called the match, which is binding and it's awful and it's terrible and it's horrible. It has some good aspects, but I haven't experienced any of them. Um, and that's how doctors figure out where they're going for residency. Well, I was like, bound into this dermatology thing. So just like any other person who decides that's not what they want to do with their life, I quit. I dropped out of the match. And I'm pretty sure my school put me under a 72-hour involuntary psychiatric admission at that point. Um, I was instructed that I had to meet with everyone from the dean to the chair of medicine to the chair of dermatology to I did have to meet with a psychiatrist um, to figure out what it was that I wanted to do because we can't have a medical school student that doesn't match because you know med schools are like rated on the percent of people that match so if I didn't match I was gonna like screw things up for Wayne State so we had to make sure we went through that um, and I ended up meeting with an internal medicine doctor who was like my assigned mentor and kind of knew a little bit about me throughout medical school and so I went into internal medicine by default. I knew I didn't want to do a lot of things. I didn't want to do anything smelly is what I said. Oh, be smelly. <laughs> Surgery, I don't know about anybody else, but I'm not a big fan of the scent of burning flesh. So OR specialties, 
out. <laughs> Pediatrics, I was a sick kid and I couldn't handle the parents that didn't show up at Children's Hospital downtown. It was devastating. No peds. So that left me with internal medicine. So I went into internal medicine and I figured I'd have lots of opportunities to decide on different things on, on a specialty afterward. Um, I fortunately was at um, a smaller hospital, uh, St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in Ann Arbor, and worked with a physician that some people may know, um, a gentleman named John Hopper. Um, he does a lot of work in the addiction realm. And so we had an addiction clinic within our um, within our residency clinic. So how I ended up getting into, indic into addiction was that um, I had one of those kind of typical residency clinic experiences where I go into the room and I'm a third year medical, third year resident, like months away from graduating. So of course I know everything there is to know. I don't need anybody supervising me. So I go into the room and it's an abysmal failure. Patient's urine drug screen is positive for benzodiazepine. She's on that magical Suboxone medication, trade uh, generic name buprenorphine naloxone. Um, and she tells me somebody must have spiked my drink. It must have been in the air. I don't know how it got in my urine. And I'm like, no, it's in your urine. This is a confirmed test. This isn't just a urine dipstick, it's for real. So of course, she's patient's frustrated. I'm frustrated. I go and I staff with Dr. Hopper and um, he walks in the room, puts the top down on the uh, can of the um, garbage, sits down on it, and he talks to the patient. And he does something. He does something really sneaky. I know it's something really sneaky. I just don't know what it is. And all of a sudden, the patient's like agreeable to the plan that I had come up with. But the patient and I were like, Wah. when I said it, that magic was motivational interviewing. So I was like, I need to learn how to do that. That is what I want to do with my life. Because if I can do that, I can totally manipulate my husband. I mean, um, I can. <laughs> I can totally get patients to like make those lifestyle changes that we're always talking about that are so hard, you know. And I'm thinking about my diabetics and my hypertensives. I'm not thinking of those addiction people. I'm just thinking about like all the people I'm going to see as a primary care doctor because now this is the 10-year plan. The 10 years plan has changed so many times that now we're on a week-to-week -week basis. Ask my husband. Um, all I know is I'm not allowed to go to any further schooling or that's or move my family. Those are both grounds for divorce. Um, it's true, it's true. These are the conversations we have. Um, so he suggested I apply for this NIDA-funded thing where I would go to Cape Cod and I'd be on this beautiful resort in the middle of Cape Cod, which sounds lovely, in May. I don't know if anybody knows New England in May, but nothing is open on Cape Cod, so they get you on this like beautiful resort, and you can't go anywhere or do anything except be at this conference. It's ingenious. Um, and they spend about half the time talking about motivational interviewing and training you how to do that, and half the time kind of doing an addiction 101 course. So. I uh, go there, and one of the experiences is you get to go into like one of those little bus van things and go to an AA meeting. Well, being the large person that I am, you can guess that I got put in the back of the bus in the middle seat, because that's where I get put every time. <laughs> driver wasn't such a great driver. Somebody might get car sick. <laughs> Needless to say, on the way back home, uh, or way back to the conference, I was sat in the front seat. Um, <laughs> so um, on the way back, I was talking to the guy, who, one of the gentlemen who was running it, and, and he said, you know, we have this new fellowship. I think you should think about applying for it in Boston. We lived in Ann Arbor. So I decided that I was going to apply to this fellowship in Boston. Fun fact, my husband's company that he worked for at the time was venture capitalist backed out of Boston, so he could make a parallel move to Boston. So we packed up our 11-week-old child and moved to Boston. This might be part of why I'm not allowed to move anymore. My son had five homes by the time he was two and a half years old. Um, so, yeah, we're not moving. Um, so, he, so we moved to Boston and I did the fellowship. So um, one of the things that, draw, that draws me to this field is that um, a lot of these people have been let down by the legal and healthcare system. And they don't have a home. They don't have a place to go. They don't have a place that they feel safe. One of the things that we provide in our clinic, which is the 75 Sheldon building, it's actually two clinics, but we kind of work as a unit, um, is we have a lobby 
And in our lobby, we have coffee. We spend 1% of our budget on coffee creamer. Because we have a lot of patients that just come to the lobby. Because it's what they'll tell us is that it's the only place they've ever felt safe. To me, that's like awful. I want to feel safe at my parents' house. I want my kids to feel safe in their home, at their grandparents' house, right? I want my kids to feel safe at school. I want my kids to feel safe in a lot of different situations. I want to feel safe in a lot of different situations. And so for my patients to come and just say, hey, is it okay if I sit in the lobby? I think speaks to how much they've been let down by our society, not just the healthcare and legal systems. They're truly the victims here. And if we can do things to work to gain their trust and move them in the right direction and help them, what we like to, call, what we like to say in our clinic, obtain the life that they want to have, then that's the ultimate goal, right? I mean, aren't we all striving to have the life that we want to have, right? Nobody's life is perfect. Nobody's life has all those components. But some of these folks have just been so disenfranchised that they don't have, they don't have a life to go to. They don't have a safe place other than our lobby. I love learning, so I love this field because it's always changing, and I have the opportunity to learn every day. I get to grow and change because the literature is changing. I get to grow and change because our treatments are changing. I get to grow and change because I learn something from my patients when they walk in the door. I've learned so much from just sitting and listening to a person and hearing their story that I, I wouldn't be able to do my job without the training that I've received from my patients and from, um, and from my colleagues. Um, I don't get to dictate. It's kind of fun being the doctor and being like, I'm wrong, you know, and having people expect me to say, no, this is what we're going to do. This is how it's got to work. But without all the different pieces in the puzzle that we're going to talk about, I wouldn't be able to do my job. And I, and I, I have to understand that I'm not, I don't cause change. It's my patients that cause change. My job is to do what I can do to help them become the person that they want to become, not the person that I think they should become. And that's a, really hard, that's a really hard thing to differentiate as a physician because we still work in a really paternalistic manner. We still say, you should take this medication, you should follow this diet, you should do these things. Even though we talk about being patient-centered, even though we talk about trying to figure out how to work that into their lives, we actually kind of do a crappy job of it. And I love watching that personal growth longitudinally, and it's, it really and truly is the most rewarding part of my job. The other reason I went into this field is, um, oops, I'm making a mess, is very personal. Um, my younger brother died of his substance use disorder. Um, he committed suicide on December 23rd of 2013, 2012, sorry. Um, my mother died Febu uh, My mother died on um, July 22nd of the previous year. So within Within 18 months, I found out that fertility treatment, I did IVF to have my son um, and was given a 2% chance of having my own child with IVF, was successful. The same day I took my brother to rehab for his alcohol use disorder. And three weeks later, they discharged him from rehab to see my mom the day before she died with no plan for follow-up, none. He then um, moved to moved from he had graduated from undergrad at Michigan State and he moved to St. Louis to start law school. Promptly failed out um, the first semester, but didn't tell any of us. He had, we had received some life insurance money from our mother, so he was using that to live on. Um, attempted to commit suicide in June of the following year. Unsuccessfully, he reached out to me. I ended up calling EMS because he well he didn't exactly he kind of sort of reached out to me. He sent me a picture of his. Um, of himself, of blood in a bathtub. Um, so I called 911 and had a safety check done on him. I'm living in Boston doing my fellowship at this time. Um, it was also the year of Hurricane Sandy and the Boston Marathon bombing. My husband also became profoundly depressed living in a large city. He grew up on a dairy farm. So um, city life is not for my husband. We live in Alto. Um, so. <laughs> um, so not a day goes by that I don't see a patient that reminds me of my family. That reminds me of people who are very near and dear to my heart. 
and that's what propels me forward. That's what makes me do what I do and want to do it to the very best of my ability. Um, and I think that's important to share because we all have a story. We have a reason we do our we do our thing. And as much as this was a circuitous route, and some if somebody had told me I would be doing I would be standing up here, when I started medical school, I would have said you're nuts. Um, little did I know that I'm the crazy one. Um, but it's um, it, it does it affects one in seven Americans. Um, the su substance use disorder affects one in seven Americans if we take out tobacco use disorder. So that's without tobacco. That's amazing. That's a SAMHSA statistic. Um, that's an amazing quantity of, of people that are affected by this disease. Um, at Spectrum, the, kind of the largest hospital system in West Michigan at this point, we have three addiction, well, soon to be three addiction physicians. Um, so the capacity to grow and the capacity to treat these folks is just phenomenal. And we all need to do our part um, to take care of these people. I will gently step down from my soapbox. One of the things that the other component of what I really enjoy about it, what I do is that I get to work with an underserved population. There is no patient that is more thankful than the underserved population. There's not, a, there's not a person that is sweeter or kinder to their providers than people who have nothing in the first kind word they've heard in years directed in their way is from their healthcare provider. That's a really powerful message to send to people. Now, that's not to say that it's always roses in the clinic. We look at patients' negative behaviors as a symptom of their disease. It's not a, it's not a reflection of them as people. It's a symptom of the disease of addiction, right? I mean, their brain is now hardwired to behave differently, to behave in a maladaptive pattern. And when I think about it, that age of the average age of first use is 12 years old. I don't know about anybody else in the room, but I'm pretty sure I was still playing house when I was 12 years old. I was not using cocaine. Unfortunately, that's not the life that all of my patients have had. And by the way, contrary to popular belief, my brother and I were raised in the same house. He wasn't raised in the garage. So this affects all different people, all different socioeconomic statuses. Uh, it, it, the, the disease of addiction knows no boundaries. Um, but when we look at these behaviors as a symptom of a disease, it's much easier to kind of redirect it, to understand it, and to not take it personally. We are between, at the 75 Sheldon, um, we have the community medicine clinic as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about them, but they do a lot of primary care work. And we get the phone call, I'm the only physician in the building right now, um, so we get the phone call pretty regularly from other clinics within Spectrum Health or from the contact center. Patients been kicked out of like every primary care option that they have. Where do they come? <laughs> they come see us. <laughs> every once in a while, we get somebody who accidentally came to see us. You know, they got like assigned one of our providers by their insurer. They usually don't last very long. They tend to not want our services, um, which is okay too. Um, so. This is going to be, we're going to get a little bit off topic, but I really believe in the concept of hope. Um, and according to Webster's Dictionary, um, the definition of hope is the feeling that what is wanted can be had or that events will turn out for the best. Hope is one of the most powerful things that I have in my clinic. I have a great prescription pad. I can write lots of prescriptions, but without hope, those prescriptions are powerless. The origin of hope um, begins with the origin of mankind. This symbol is known as the anchor cross, where the bull portion of the, of the symbol is, recept is the symbol of receptivity open upwards toward the spiritual world and is crowned with the cross of matter, representing the actual and continual existence of the material world. It's a Christian symbol of hope from the time when the Christians in the Roman Empire had to practice their religion in secret because of the persecutions. Um, so this was one of the ways that they communicated that, the, that it was a safe place to be. It was a safe, it was a safe location to experience express themselves as an individual. We hope that our clinic, in the same way that we hope that our clinic is a safe place to, for patients to express themselves as individuals. Um, I challenge people to consider whether or not hope is a rational reaction. Um, and I think in healthcare, we tend to look at hope as being irrational. Um, but we've shown time and time again in the palliative care literature especially that um, people do better when they have some form of hope. Um, people at the, end of, at the end of life, it is very clear that if we don't do the aggressive 
progressive chemotherapy and we institute palliative care, they live longer. What's the differentiating factor? I call it hope. Other people may call it by a different name. Hope is constructed not just from our rational deliberation, it's also from the conscious weighing of information as it arises um, as a combination of our thoughts and feelings. And the feelings are created in part by the neural input from the organs and tissues around us. Our brain takes the stimuli from our physical body and assimilates it um, within our brain. And I think that that um, really speaks to how we can use, how we can harness people's thoughts, behaviors, and beliefs into providing them with better care. I don't know if people recognize the gentleman on the left. My daughter's name is Eleanor after his wife, as a good hint. Um, that's FDR, right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of our presidents. Um, I think we can all probably agree that being president of the United States is a pretty tough job. Not a job that like everybody wants to have, not a job that everybody can do. Wouldn't we think that we would want a strong, healthy person to be president? Most people know that FDR had polio, but he was in, wheelchair, in a wheelchair for much of his presidency. This is the only publicly available image of FDR in a wheelchair because they kept it such a, such a strongly hidden secret. Knowing what this disease is and the effects that it can have, a lot of people wouldn't expect a person with such a de significantly debilitating disease to be able to become president. Um, in the 1930s and 40s, Americans knew Franklin Roosevelt from his warm and reassuring radio voice and not his crippled status, as it's, as it's often quoted as. Um, a cooperative press and vigilant secret service made sure there were almost no pictures in, and literally no film of FDR actually in a wheel, wheelchair. Um, so I, I challenge us to think about that and think about what our patients are capable of doing. Think about what our, how much better of a society we would have if we instead of discouraging people from becoming the, peop the person that they want to become, we encourage them to become the best person that they can become. In our society, when we, look, when we look at people, we judge them. I experience this every day. Not a day goes by that somebody doesn't come up to me and ask me about my cancer. It's part of my life. I've learned to deal with it. My mother died of cancer, um, so I'm sensitive to that. Um, but it's just not what's going on with me. Um, does anybody? that has have had a minute to look at that picture. I don't know if anybody's noticed the um, abnormality in the picture, but the baby has no arms. Can you look beyond that and see what Mother Teresa's looking at? I like to think she's looking into that baby's eyes and not seeing the baby's deficits or weakness, but searching for, her, for the baby's strength, giving hope that perhaps, in spite of all the challenges this child will have, they will overcome this lifelong test to be a successful and contributing member of society. Perhaps this child will, become, will grow up to become a world leader. Perhaps they'll grow to touch thousands of lives with her story. If we learn to use our challenges to make the world a better place, we've helped. Could we in our position as healthcare providers and a sort of gatekeeper help give people the gift of hope that they can learn to lead their lives with a disease rather than letting their disease lead their life? That's what I try to do in my clinic. It's a huge challenge. We're gonna move on to why do I practice at 75 Sheldon. Um, it's a huge focus of leadership. I have such strong support within my division that I can do things that most people within primary care can't do. We have a consortium that we're gonna talk about a lot and that really opens doors for us and without the support of my leadership, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, we have a lot of partnerships with people like Great Lakes Health Connect, um, with Network 180, uh, with uh, Priority Health, with a lot of different stakeholders within the community to try to um, build up some of, some of what, we, uh, what we can provide for people um, and the patient population. I wouldn't be doing what I do if I didn't get to work with the patients that I want to, and I love the people I work with. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the population profile of the two clinics. So the Center for Integrative Medicine was started by an emergency medicine physician, and the intent was to address the issue of super utilizers in the emergency department as defined at Spectrum Health um, as being visiting an emergency, one of the Spectrum Health emergency departments 10 or more times in two of the last three consecutive years. 
Um, what that person found was that um, about 70% of those patients have a substance use disorder. They're often patients who have been kicked out of primary care. They're often patients who are on high doses of opiates and don't have a way to access them any longer. Um, they're often patients who are have behavioral who have behavioral manifestations of their disease that result in them getting kicked out of the. Um, kicked out of regular primary care. So the vast majority of these people are for are people who for some reason or another do not have access to primary care. Obviously with the Affordable Care Act, there's less uninsured folks in that category than there were. We also see um, pregnant women on opioids um, because we're one of the, we're one of few sites that has that capability. The community medicine clinic is also in the 75 Sheldon uh, building and their focus is on the uninsured, underinsured, um, homeless um, and other folks who have otherwise been kicked out of primary care. So we have um, this thing called CG CAPS. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it's essentially a survey that goes out to patients. We have a really poor response rate because, um, again, we work with a lot of homeless people, so addresses are a little difficult. And unfortunately, we're not allowed to give this out in our clinic. But for the people that do fill it out, we have pretty um, good rates of patients who would recommend us to other clinics, and these are usually the people that get kicked out, you know, in part in their CG caps. They cause the CG cap score to go down in those other primary care clinics. So we're pretty fortunate that we're able to um, help patients make that change and develop that trust in the healthcare system, so that they are likely to recommend coming to see. Um, coming to see us or coming to see a provider in our clinic. Um, I also broke it down by payer mix. So Center for Integrative Medicine is CIM, and Community Medicine is CMC. So you can see um, pretty clearly that we see a Medicaid population. Um, we do have some commercial um, insurance as well. Uh, Priority Health is one of our funding sources, so they direct more patients our way than other, than other payers. So why do I keep talking about this collaboration thing and, and what, when am I gonna get to why we're all here talking about collaboration with um, what Great Lakes Health Connect does? Um, so one of the things that we have is we have these, these three big, these three sources of money, essentially, that come into the clinic. Um, Network 180, Priority Health, and Spectrum Health. And traditionally, all of these systems are very separate, right? So we've got the insurer, and they approve or they don't approve, and usually the people at, you know, the doctors at the clinic level are getting frustrated because I want to give this patient this, and the insurance is rejecting it, and now I'm arguing with the insurance, and it becomes like a kind of a nightmare and then difficult and the patient's stuck in the middle because they're not getting the treatment that they need, and it's kind of awful. Um, and then we have network, one, and then we have, oops, I did that backwards, sorry. Um, and then we have Network 180, which is our community mental health here in Kent County. And they provide us, um, they're contracted through Spectrum Health to provide us with social workers. So we have um, four social workers in the building, and they do both coordination of care, um, outreach, and um, direct therapy in the, in the clinic. Just yesterday, one of our social workers went out to a patient's house because they've been missing, um, which is not something that the Spectrum Health employed social workers are um, able to do. Um, so what we end up seeing is that we find that we all have a lot of overlap in what we want to do um, in, in our goals for treating patients. So I like to think that we're working toward living in that little tiny triangle right there where everybody kind of shares their information and we work together. So my Network 180 social workers will pull the information, the notes from the Network 180 system so I can see the psychiatrist notes. I can see the, I can see the case manager's notes. I can see the recovery coach's notes. They can can see what's been approved for the patient in the past, how many hospitalizations they've had, that kind of information for us. And then Priority Health often provides us with information about you know, other ER visits, how many times they've been to other ERs. They can't give us specific information about those ER visits, but they can tell us what's been paid out for some, for some of these things. And then, of course, I have access to the Spectrum Health as a Spectrum Health employed physician. So one of the big things that we do in the 75 Sheldon building is primary care. Spectrum Health provides the doctors and the PAs. Um, we don't have any, any NPs, but we're not close to the option. Um, to provide prim primary care for patients. Network 180, again, provides our social workers. And Priority Health provides community workers as well as um, a nurse case manager for our population. <clears throat> so we provide addiction medicine services, addiction medicine doctor. We provide acupuncture. 
We provide behavioral health. We provide infectious diseases. Acupuncture and infectious diseases, we have two doctors starting at the end of this month, and one is an acupuncturist, and one is internal medicine, infectious diseases, and addiction medicine. So some of this is kind of coming up in the next couple of weeks here. We provide a lot of refugee services. Um, we work with a high number of refugees, and as a result of that, we're currently, as part of that, I guess not a result of it, as part of that, we're currently working with a um, very high rate of HIV-positive infected in individuals as well. We have bilingual services. We have two providers that um, are Spanish-speaking um, as well. We have a free store, um, and that's mostly provided. That's mostly th uh, things provided by the by community members. Um, we also have a food pantry, um, and that is uh, through Feeding America. You can actually designate our food pantry as a as a as a location for the for it to go directly to the pantry. We have a chiropractor on services and we have that lobby that I talked about a little earlier. So we've got a lot of different things that we provide for patients um, and in a lot of different ways that we act as a safety net. Um, and I think that's really important for uh, what what our patients needs are because sometimes it, because really, I mean if I think about it, if I don't know where my next meal is coming from, I'm really not worried about my risk of stroke 10 years from now. I'm not going to worry about taking that antihypertensive. It's not doing anything for me. I'm not feeling anything different, but I feel hunger. I feel sleeping on the streets. I feel worrying about where my next meal, where my next safe place to stay is going to be. We also have AmeriCorps members. Um, they provide us with assistance in um, coordinating care with refugee services and as well as at the food pantry. So the goals of the clinic we've talked a little bit about, but we try to meet the individualized needs. Each patient gets an individualized plan um, that we try to circle back to about once every three months to make sure that we're starting to address the patient's concerns and the patient's needs and not just focusing on our concerns and our needs or where we think the patient should be concerned. Um, we, we are designated as a medical home. We're that safe place. Um, our goal is to reduce harm. So we don't punish patients for maybe um, not having urines as expected. Um, we don't punish patients for um, not showing in our clinic. We have a no discharge policy. We don't discharge patients. They do discharge us, but we don't discharge them um, because, again, we want to be a safe place. And part of being a safe place is being able to coordinate and understand all the different aspects of the patient's care rather than just focusing on the medical care, just focusing on the behavioral health care, just focusing on the addiction care, and not coordinating with each other. So one of the things that we really work hard in our, in our clinic is to mend people with more than just our scientific knowledge and pharmacotherapy. Um, the world breaks anyone, everyone. Str some are strong in the broken places. Is from a farewell to arms. Um, how do we help people that, who are emotionally and physically broken? Um, there's, and back in 2001, there was an exploratory study in um, the Journal of General Internal Medicine from Johns Hopkins University that showed that patients who had survived a life-threatening illness stressed the importance of physician empathy. The patients did not necessarily expect doctors to have a discussion of spirituality, but they did appreciate physician respect of their spirituality. The patients also valued questions about their ability to cope and what support systems they had in place. I consider an addic addiction a life-threatening illness. People overdose in 2015. Kent County experienced the highest number of overdoses that it had um, in recorded history. The state of Michigan is number 15 for highest rate of increase of opiate overdose deaths. Wayne County from 2012 to 2014 lost 1% of its, of its population to overdose. So the literal, the literal translation of hope from Latin is I shall please. The term finds its origin in the Catholic Vesper service for the dead. Paid mourners would, would historically participate in, this, in the service to pacify the grieving, grieving families. The translation into medicine would be to pacify the patient. Originally, a placebo was given to appease demanding or desperate patients. In the 1950s, it changed to be used in scientific studies to mute the background noise of hope judged as a zero point whereupon the therapy could be measured. 
An article in 2002 from JAMA selected normal volunteers and placed electrodes on either side of the he their head. The participants were told a low voltage current would pass, but a dummy dial was turned that did not have any electrical activity. One third to one half of the subjects reported a headache from the non-existent current. We see this all the time. Um, my question is, are placebos inert? Do belief and expectations affect pain, physical debility, and addiction? Our psychiatry colleagues are pretty well versed in the positive effects of placebo. Studies of antidepressant therapies show that approximately a 30% clinical benefit from placebo. Are there other ways in which our brain and mind can overcome disease? That's one of the things that we challenge ourselves with in the clinic. Are there ways that we can use, we can harness some of these other things? I constantly tell people that I have the easiest job of anyone in the clinic. I focus on writing the prescription and making sure they're safe from the prescription standpoint. The next hardest job would be the social workers, because they've got to work with those patients and use that motivational interviewing skill that I talked about that I must not be very good at, um, because my husband doesn't listen to me hardly ever. Um, and we. And, and they work with the patient to affect lifestyle and behavior change. And, act, and, and that actually changes the structure of the brain. It changes literally what the brain structure looks like. When somebody, I said before that when somebody, the initial age of first use is usually around 12, you're, the frontal lobe of your brain is developed in your mid to late 20s. They don't have a frontal lobe. They just don't have it developed. They can't, when I talk about the frontal lobe, I, I consider it the CEO of the brain. It's the one that makes the executive decisions. It's the one that says, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. It's the one that says, you know, I should probably eat some salad before I eat an ice cream sundae. Now my four-year-old would be more than happy to have an ice cream sundae every night for dinner. So it's my job as his parent to help him have to be his forebrain, to be his executive, to say, no, we're not going to have an ice cream sundae for dinner. You have to eat four bites. He's four years old. Eleanor has to eat two bites because she's two years old of whatever dinner is. And then you can decide you didn't like it because after one bite, you can't tell me you didn't like it. This is the rule in my house. We have this conversation probably five out of seven nights a week. Um, he doesn't have a frontal lobe, and he chooses not to remember that. But I can get that same four-year-old to practice piano every night for one Skittle. <laughs> he gets to pick which color. We have a jar of Skittles, and he gets to pick one if he practices piano. He also gets a sticker, and if he does, practices five days in a row, then he gets to go into the treat box, and the treat box has like bouncy balls and you know little toy cars and little junk crap that I bought for them. <laughs> um, but it gets us to practice piano because he doesn't have the cognitive ability, he doesn't have the frontal lobe to say, if I practice piano, I'm going to get better at piano. But he sure as heck is really proud that he can play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star on that piano like a star. He plays it for everyone. I mean, you walk in my house and he's like, can I do a concert? But he doesn't have the frontal lobe to realize that the reason he can do that concert and he can play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star like a champ is that he practices every day, right? And my patients often don't have a frontal lobe even though they're in their 50s because they never developed one. So that's what my social workers are working on. They're working on developing a frontal lobe. It's some of the most frustrating work in the world. I give them lots of credit because there are certainly times that I'm like, really? They're positive again? Behind the door, behind the closed doors. So can you tell me a little bit about what was going on? <laughs> you know, we gotta, you gotta fake it till you make it sometimes. You know, we all get frustrated with people in our lives and we all get frustrated with some of the things that, are pa that my patients do, but we have to remember that it's because they don't have that frontal lobe. It's not their fault. They just don't have one. So we've gotta work with them to develop one. So I like to always talk about the nocebo effect as well. So this is when adverse effects or toxicities occur from inert treatments. What, what, so what I think about that, when I think about this, I think about the power of suggestion as it translates into what we see in patients. If we tell a patient that side effects may include nausea, vomiting, headache, et cetera, you've all seen the commercials, um, 
they're more likely to have it even if they're just being given a placebo. Does that discount, though, the subjective feeling of having nausea, vomiting, et cetera? I don't think so, but can we switch that to harbor the energy into a positive way? So I'm gonna start you on this fantastic medication. It's called citalopram. And I am just, I've, you know, there's a whole bunch of medications in this class, in this group of antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, pick your, pick your poison whenever the patient's complaining of higher. Um, and I really thought hard about this, and you know, some of them are better for different types of symptoms, but I think this is the one for you. Now, there are some people that occasionally have a side effect from it, and you know, we can we'll go through that go through that list. But let's focus on what we're looking at to get out of this medication. Now, be sure, be aware that it's not going to take effect overnight. We got to be on this medication for like two months before we know if it's really if it's really helping. But that's because it takes that much time to change your brain chemistry. No, we're not writing Xanax. Um, moving on. Um, we, you know, but having those conversations with patients and, and really emphasizing the positives that you're looking at, both in, both in the therapies that I'm giving them, but also in focusing on the positives and what they're doing. So you said, so we had this, I had this conversation with a patient, with a patient yesterday. So the first time you offered cocaine, you said no. You said you didn't want it. That's great. How did you do that? What was going on? How were you able to do that? Because that's different from what you've done before. I know that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I heard her when she said, when I saw the urine drug screen and it showed that it was positive for cocaine and we call that an unexpected result. People are not dirty or clean. It's an unexpected result. Um, so, I said, so I said to her, you know, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about what about what about how you were able to make a positive choice. Doesn't that feel really good? I know, I know she ended up using, but what can we can we pull some of that positive out and then look at maybe, you know, what could we change about what you about what happened rather than focusing on the fact that we had that positive urine and that that's a negative. So what are some of the future directions? What are my hopes, dreams, and aspirations for our clinics today? Now, like I said before, um, I am entitled to changing my plan every week. Um, we want to increase community engagement and resource utilization. We want to increase our service area impact. We're adding additional providers with new services, as I mentioned earlier. We want to figure out a way to measure community effect. I mean, we, we, we firmly believe we have a, a community effect. It's, it's finding those data points that's, that are kind of hard. You know, how many people have jobs? How many people that didn't, how many people have housing and are no longer on the streets? How many people are, um, you know, how many, how many people are able to keep their children um, when CPS cases are open on them, things like that. Um, we're looking to change the model of our, of our building from having two clinics with separate entry points to having a single entry point so that we can serve more patients. One of the challenges at the Center for Integrative Medicine is that people get there and they really like it. So they don't wanna leave. So then when I try to send them to see somebody else, they go, I'm not going. And then we go, well, you gotta go. And then they go, well, I'm not going. And then they don't make the appointment, and they run out of meds, and then we feel bad. And again, we don't kick people out of our clinic, so then they come back and see us, and then you know, we're stuck with them. Um, so we've ended up closed more than we're open in the last five years. So that's a problem, because we need to make sure that we're open for access. So we're hoping that flipping that model and focusing on getting people in for crime, primary care and then addiction services kind of a la carte as needed and meeting the patient where they are in our clinic rather than trying to force the patient to fit into one clinic or the other will allow us to serve a, serve a larger population. Um, working on e uh, um, efficient screening for um, other, healthcare, other healthcare issues, uh, we aren't the greatest at making sure that people are getting things like their immunizations, and that's another reason why I want to combine the two clinics into one, because the clinic that's focused on primary care, guess what? They do a great job at primary care. So my patients aren't getting the primary care that they need um, and that they deserve to have because they're people just like everybody else in the community, um, because we're, fo we're hyper focused focus on that addiction piece. Um, and I want to decrease stigma through education. That's part of why I have a point three position over at MSU working with the first year medical students. Because I figure if I get them young, they can't really argue with me because I definitely know more than them in my wise old age. Um, We've kind of already discussed the collaboration between Network 180, Priority Health, and Spectrum Health, and how that plays a distinct role in helping us provide some of, some of these umbrella services for people. So I want to um, move on to discuss a little bit more about how how we get that information together. So we actually sit in a conference room every morning, 
And we talk about every patient that we're going to see that day. And we pull and we sit there with the Network 180 computer, and we've got the Spectrum Health computer on the big like TV screen out in front of us, and we've got the Priority Health um, uh, nurse case manager sitting there with her computer open, and we try to combine that to make sure that we're not missing anything. Each system has a vital piece of information, but it takes us so much time to go through that that it's like, it's ridiculous because we're looking up each person and each system separately every single time. Um, one of the things, we'll get back to how we've improved upon that. I think some people in the room might know. Um, one of the other things that we have is we have these emergency room care plans. Like I said before, um, we were started by an emergency room physician. So we actually have a really awesome consortium in Kent County, and I don't know of anybody else who has this. I mean, it's between all three of the hospital systems here. And um, we can actually get a single plan of care for a patient throughout all four hospital ERs. So here's. Here is a um, patient story. I will use the name that my um, colleague over in one of the surgical specialties gave her, Crazy Shoulder Girl. So Crazy Shoulder Girl, because this is what this is part of the education and the stigma thing, right? So Crazy Shoulder Girl is only allowed to get her opiates and benzodiazepines from me because she has been on. She ha, she actually came to our clinic on 374 morphine equivalents a day. Yeah, she like weighs 120 pounds. Oh, let's add on to that. She's on five milligrams of Valium a day. She has a condition called Ehlers-Danlos, where the kind of joints are, are loose and lax. Um, and so her shoulder comes out of the socket pretty regularly. She ended up at University of Michigan and had her left shoulder fused, so she can no longer kind of do this. So it's fused down, which means that her range of motion is this. And so she can kind of hardly brush the back of her hair, can get food to her mouth, and can take care of kind of the bottom half. Um, her other shoulder, she goes to the emergency room three to four times a month because she gets it out of socket, which is part of the disease. It's not gonna cause impingement. It's not gonna cause her not to have blood supply and have negative effects of all of that. So there's really, so we're on the phone, so we get on the phone with the orthopedic doctor and we say, Doc, Mr. Orthopedic Doctor, can you tell me what the best treatment for this patient is? He said, reassurance. Do not put her joint back in the socket. She doesn't need it. Because every time she goes to the emergency room, what happens? They give her Valium. They give her Dilaudid. And they put the shoulder back in socket. And he said, there's no reason to do that. So we were able to come up with a care plan. And we were able to talk about it with, the ER, with the, all three directors of the ERs doesn't get much better than that, to say this is the plan of course for the patient. This is how we as a community can provide her with a single unified plan, with a single unified story, so that she's not getting one message from me, because I'm not an orthopedic guy. I have no, I have no idea. I had no idea that it didn't need to go in. Every time they called me from the ear and said it was out of socket, I was like, Put it back in, I, I don't know, you know, she might like lose her arm if we don't, right? Like, this is dumb internist. Um, so, we, so that's what I was doing, because they know that when, pretty much when the ER sees my name or, my, or the building that I work in, they, they tell them they can't have any opiates and they call me, or they call whoever's on call. Um, and so they, so we, um, so we were able to do that for this patient. We were able to give them, we were able to give them, I mean, she's not happy. Big shock there. She's not happy because now she goes to the emergency room and they don't give her opiates and they don't give her Valium. And they tell her, you'll be okay. They'll sling it. Help it get back in, that'll help it naturally go back in is what I was told by my orthopedic colleague. Um, and that's the best treatment for her. But we weren't able to do that without having this group. And, it's a little bit more complicated. The legal people don't really like us talking about patients across systems, but we've been able to kind of make those legal people do their thing, and they've been able to make it work. So I don't ask me for the details. That's what I know. Um, this also just decreases what we commonly refer to as splitting behavior, so the behavior of kind of going back and forth and, and he, said, he said, she said type of behaviors that we, that we often get. So 
This is what everybody's been waiting for. This is the slide of the day. Instead of, remember I said all those different people had like different laptops out and open and looking at all these different sources? We're able to get almost all of that information from Great Lakes Health Connect, which is pretty amazing. And the other thing that we can see is we can now see like lab results, imaging results, notes from the ER, what's been done. So my favorite story about Great Lakes Health Connect, and I'm sure some of the folks in the room have heard it, but it's my absolute favorite. We have this one young lady. She's actually coming to see us in the clinic this afternoon. And she's got some, she doesn't technically have a substance use disorder. She gets one, five milligram, she gets one five milligram hydrocodone acetam, five slash 325 hydrocodone acetaminophen, she gets 10 tabs a month total. So she doesn't, so she's not a huge, she's not like one of my patients on buprenorphine, but she has a pretty difficult home life. She's a single parent of five children, um, and she you know, really, she, she has a very difficult home life. Um, I probably don't need to go in the de into the details, but at one point, um, she fell this spring, and she hurt her back in the bathroom, and the story kept changing. One time, she, you know, she came in to see us the next day, didn't lose consciousness. The next day, she lost consciousness. Then we got phone calls saying that she had, you know, incontinence issues. So she ended up going to three different emergency rooms at all three different systems over the course of three different days. Guess what she got for her loss of consciousness and urinary symptoms every time? A CT scan. Three CT scans in three days for the same complaint. Why was that? Because nobody knew what anybody else was doing. Had they all had access to Viper, they would have known. They would have been able to prevent that. So when she came to my office and she said, I'm having these symptoms and now I'm having this urinary, you know, last week when she came in, she didn't lose consciousness, she didn't have urinary incontinence, but this time she comes in and she's got urinary incontinence and loss of consciousness, I can say, you know what, we know you're safe because you've had three CT scans in the last four days. <laughs> I mean, so you know what, I'm really confident that you're safe. Let's talk about what, let's, let's redirect that conversation. Let's talk about what we can do for the pain. Let's talk about what else might be causing this incontinence. Let's talk about treatments for those things. Let's, let's, let's focus our energy back on what's going on with you because further imaging isn't going to tell us anything. I don't need to get labs. I don't need to get imaging because I've got all that information from Great Lakes Health Connects Viper. I mean, I sound like a commercial, but it's pretty amazing. It really um, changes what we do with our patients. We've caught, we've caught so many near misses with patient safety from Viper that when they asked me to do this, I was like, no problem because we need to get the message out that Viper is a great way to gather information about our patients and it's an amazing resource to have that we're so fortunate that we're so fortunate to have. Back to um, the young lady with ehlers Stanless on her shoulder. We were, we were able to see things that she was doing at U of M without needing without needing to I mean, we had regular conversations with Dr. Grant down at U of M, um, who was her treating physician. He and I were like on a first name basis. Um, but we were able to kind of see in real time what was going on. So when she said, when, when it became a he said, she said, um, between that physician and myself, we were able to look at Great Lakes Health Connect and even see what was happening on the other side of the state. I know that's all Detroit for you, but um, U of M's in Ann Arbor. It's a separate city. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Oakland County, um, so, <laughs> so um, but we were able to we were able to see to see that information to make sure that we were giving we are giving patients consistent clear messages as a healthcare as a healthcare group as as a healthcare industry as a as all of the providers. So if I can see what my colleague is doing, regardless of whether or not they're at Spectrum, I mean Spectrum would hate me for saying this, so I will deny it. Um, but I can. It's sometimes it's just easier for communication purposes to refer somebody to somebody refer a patient to a provider within the Spectrum system because I can see the notes, but we don't have any nephrologists. So I have a patient with polycystic kidney disease. I have no idea what's going on with her. And then uh, she's on um, buprenorphine naloxone, and then she gets a prescription for um, hydrocodone acetaminophen from her nephrologist. And I go, ah, 
we don't, that's, that's no, one, it's unfair to the patient because it's not going to work. I, I could explain why, but it's not going to work. So it's unfair to the patient because it's not going to address her concern. Right, but I, but so if I could refer to a nephrologist within my system, communication's easier between us. But with Viper, I don't have to worry about that. I can refer to whoever I want. I can refer anywhere and I can get the information and it's practically real time. And so I can make sure that my patients are getting the care that they need. And that's pretty powerful. Um, some of, the, some of the impacts that I think for, come out of this collaboration is improved patient care, increased information sharing, decreased redundant testing, and improved relationships with individual patients. Sure, back, girl, back lady and shoulder girl were not thrilled when they realized that they weren't going to get what they wanted, but we were able to, but if we can redirect that conversation, then we can use that as a chance to gain more trust with that patient because then they'll see that we actually, we actually care enough to go that extra step. And for most, for most patients, whether they're one of my patients or, or in my special population or not, they, that hasn't been a possibility before. So we're almost there. Tigger versus Eeyore. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a pretty big Disney fan. Um, I went to California on a Friday and came home on a Sunday, and I went to Disneyland on Friday um, because I really love Disneyland. My cousin also is an executive at Disney, so I get free Disneyland park tickets. Um, pretty amazing. Um, so Winnie the Pooh is this gentleman, and he's kind of—he's a pretty classic children's uh, character in a popular Disney character family. Two of the characters are Tigger and Eeyore, and they exemplify two different points of view. Tigger's catchphrases are, the most wonderful thing about Tigger's is I'm the only one, and TTFN, ta-ta for now. Very positive, very happy. Well, Eeyore's catchphrases are, thanks for noticing me, and a kind of a melancholy, okay. We all have the opportunity to choose how we want to live our lives, like a Tigger ready for the next adventure, or like an Eeyore just happy to be noticed. It's up to each of us. Do we want to grab life by the horns and make the world a better place, or are we going to allow ourselves to be victims of a system that doesn't promote collaboration to improve patient care and outcomes? After all, our patients have the gifts of healing that they can provide to us as well. Let's commit to using technology to give our patients the gift of collaboration, and while doing so, show them that they can be resilient in the face of disease, death, and heartache. You may find it helps us become a better patient-centered community. I'd like to end with a quote. Oops. Um, professor Randy Pouch was a computer scientist professor at Carnegie Mellon University. He was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in September of 2006. On September 18th of 2007, one year later, he gave a lecture entitled The Last Lecture which is a tradition at Carnegie Mellon for departing and retiring professors. Dr. Pausch entitled his Really Achieving Your Childhood Dreams. It was originally posted on YouTube for a handful of people unable to attend, but became a sensation quickly with over 10 million hits and translations into over six languages. He also co-authored a book by the same name. Unfortunately, he succumbed to pancreatic cancer on July 25th, 2008. His lecture has become a sort of underground mantra. People quote it and use it to inspire themselves and others. His lessons are pretty universal. Universal, and I'd like to close with the following quote from him. Brick walls are there for a reason. The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to show how badly we want something because the brick walls are there to stop the people who don't want something bad enough. They are there to keep out the other people. Diseases can take away a large part of who we are, but they can also be a gift teaching us about ourselves, helping us grow in ways we never thought possible. It might not just be about writing a prescription or telling a patient what we think they should do. It may lie in listening to the patient. Thank you so much for your time today. I'd just like to close to all the people who have lost their lives to addiction and those that try to prevent further losses. Thank you. So we have time for, time for maybe one or two quick questions. If there are any that you would like to address to the, Dr. Pullman. Mary, is that a question for Dr. No? Okay. Any, any? Okay. Thank you. Dr. Paul, thank you so much.
This is not scheduled, but we're going to take a quick just five minute bio break um, and, uh, and then uh, reconvene here for the town meeting. We've got a little bit of moving around to do up here, just a little bit. And uh, if anybody has question cards, now is the time. So find a GLHC staff person uh, and hand those to them, and then they will in turn get them to the people who need to have them. So about five minutes, we'll reconvene. Thanks, Mitch.
You know what I didn't do? I'm, I'm, Julie would be the person to notice this, but I have podium signs with our logo all over them that are in my trunk that aren't doing us any good in our trunk. No. I'll remember them for the trunk. Oh, no. <laughs> That's right. I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, I guess I did. I'm going to leave it. I had to go I had to go so bad. I was like, I hope this Does she not know? Does she not know? I guess not. What are we waiting for? Mary, I don't think she knew. <laughs> you didn't get the memo? You didn't get the memo? <laughs> Come on, Mary. It's all mad. I can't come up here. You needed a rose before Put you right there. That's else. right. Nobody told me it was on a panel. <laughs> There's no working on your laptop over here. Yeah. Yeah, who's the panel person working on their laptop over I haven't worked on my laptop in a room yet. <laughs> we're, we're all looking at <laughs> Any question, we're just going to look at you. I didn't know that. But no. But um. But that's why. I'm gonna kill you later. Just so you know. No, that's why I mentioned you the softball that I heard you talking about. I thought it was me sleeping. No. I definitely question you directly toward here. Yes. Doug, they're being very mean to me. I gave him a recommendation on one. So. I can't hear him. What do you say? a recommendation that you can be ever Yes, you'll be happy. Barry wants to go first. You're going to need a microphone. Remember to go. Barry? Barry, what do you think? Yep. Well, we should talk to I got one thing done today. Thank you. No, that's all right. Okay, if I, can st if I can still be heard out in the uh, fireside room area, if you're still getting your afternoon caffeine fix, I encourage you to do that and make your way back in. We're going to get started. <laughs> we hope everybody's having an uh, uh, informative and productive day thus far. And we're going to move into what we're calling our town hall meeting segment uh, for this afternoon. So several, several of you have, have either uh, electronically or, or in writing submitted questions. Uh, is there any, anybody who's holding a card right now that you would like to get to uh, speak now or forever hold your peace? And I'll go with what we've got. Otherwise, uh, you will also have, uh, uh, we'll have uh, microphones uh, working the room, and if you have a question that you would like to raise from the floor, we, we encourage you to do that as well. I will ask you to please wait for the microphone to come to you uh, because we are live streaming the presentation, and so um, uh, you cannot be heard if you are not electronically enhanced. So um, 
Uh, for our town meeting this afternoon, my name is Brian Mack. I manage marketing and communications for Great Lakes Health Connect, and I'll be moderating for the next uh, half hour, 40 minutes or so. Uh, you have all already met Doug, our executive director. Um, we have two of our leadership team who are, uh, one who is, at a, is at a conference and the other is on vacation. And so when we have two senior leadership people out, it takes two people per person to backfill for that individual. So, <laughs> uh, so Chris Ford and Mary Graham are, uh, are here uh, you know, for, for George Bosniak, who is our director of, of uh, business development. And, um, and then Julie Klossing is also uh, away on vacation. And so uh, Steve Speaker and Adam uh, G are both uh, representing for her. Um, and then Craig is also here, who is the director of, oh, I'm gonna get that wrong. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Um, Technology services thank and support. You. Gosh, I wanted to say operations, and I was like, that wasn't right. Um, so uh, yeah, would you, if you would like to, yeah, briefly just uh, introduce yourselves and what your uh, role is, and, um, and we'll go from there. Well, Doug Dietzman, Executive Director for the organization, so I get to do a little of everything. Chris Ford, Account Manager uh, in Business Development. Steve Speaker, over Manager of Solution Support. Mary Graham, Manager for Community Engagement. <laughs> Craig Meyer, Technology Services and Support, handling infrastructure, desktop security, along with my cohort, Lisa, who's out there. I'm gonna point her out and make her feel uncomfortable. She but. Uh, and she won't come up. Adam G, I'm the manager of our project management team. Okay, so jumping right in, again, we took a variety of questions from a variety of sources. We had uh, some invitations that were sent out and so had some of those things submitted electronically as well as those that have been su submitted in writing throughout the day today. Um, and uh, uh, Doug, we're gonna get the big one out of the way right off the bat. Um, and uh, that is one that, that uh, I know that our implementation consultants get on a very regular basis, which is um, how, how would you characterize the relationship, uh, Great Lakes Health Connect's relationship between those other health information exchanges in the state of Michigan, and how does that differ from MIHIN, the Michigan Health Information Network? Okay, so um, GLHC, um, was founded uh, by the provider organizations uh, to serve certain needs. And so we have become, over time, statewide. So we have now uh, 129 hospitals cover 85% uh, of the acute care beds in the state, pretty much everything below the bridge, although there's a couple hospitals uh, up there, and then 4,000 connected locations in some way or another. Um, we are funded and sustained exclusively by our participants and, and solving problems um, for them uh, in ways that entice them to want to pay us to help solve those problems for them. So we're not federally funded, we're not state funded. Uh, we are funded by our participants uh, you know, as our business model. So you know, we were born to solve these problems. MyHIN was created um, uh, back in the day uh, with the state and operational plan to say there's going to be multiple of these HIE things in the state. So there needs to be something at the state level to kind of coordinate their activities. And then also uh, maybe be a front door as it's evolved to the state itself. So all the immunizations, all the reportable labs, everything kind of coming in and out of the state goes through uh, MIHIN. That's kind of their chosen vehicle for a single doorway into their systems. So we interact uh, a great deal with MyHIN, their use cases, uh, those that I mentioned, uh, as well as uh, others that are in the works. Nobody has done more with them to successfully implement the, uh, the use cases that uh, all of you really, uh, we're, we're working on your behalf to make sure we get you connected in a way that either meets your meaningful use requirements, that sort of thing. Um, really, I think one of the finer points is if you, if you talk about what is a health information exchange, um, if, if the way I view it, it's an organization that's in the business first and foremost and primarily for doing what we're doing in connecting a community together. Um, 
on that definition, I'd say GLHC is the only one in the state. Health information exchange is a verb, and data is exchanged, and there are lots of organizations that do that with other partners as kind of an aside. Uh, they're either providers who do it, or there are health plans that do it. There are other organizations that do it. GLHC uh, is the only one, as I understand it, and spend a lot of time up there, is the only organization in the state that was created specifically and primarily for linking the healthcare system, all components, multi-vendor, multi-stakeholder, all pieces and parts. So a um, little bit longer answer to the question, but essentially the MyHIN has uh, use cases that are defined through the state or through uh, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield sorts of requirements that the providers need to meet. We are deeply engaged and regularly engaged with them to make those things uh, happen. Uh, but what we do is on the ground, which is not where my hint is. So we're, we're in the community at a very local level like we're talking about here, and then we interact with them at a state level relative to how things need to be shared in and through their, um, uh, through the state or other uh, use cases that they have. Thanks. Uh, Craig, here's, this is a security question that's going um, directed toward you, that there have been, uh, well, it seems like virtually every day, but very recently a couple of significant stories about um, uh, security breaches involving health data and health information. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, what GLHC is doing to protect the PHI that we manage? Sure. So I think when, when we talk about security and overall um, just network safety and, and patient you know, health information safety, it's really talking, looking at it from a multi-tiered approach. Um, I think what we try to do within Great Lakes Health Connect is truly to understand that we need to you know, really obviously handle that data in a specific way and not let easy access to it, um, being able to secure our internal network but also our laptops and our uh, desktops as well. Um, I think you see, you know, too, in a lot of different healthcare news, you know, breaches of information based on malware, um, you know, antivirus issues, um, folks just surfing, um, bringing, you know, personal laptops in, in from home and things like that. Um, part of that, too, is if um, folks were able to sit and uh, in the earlier session with Nate Steed, is really to understand you know, and, and implement policies and procedures within your own environment. And obviously, you know, Great Lakes is, has been doing that and continues to modify and, and tweak those policies and procedures internally. Um, we're looking at or, or pursuing high trust certification as well, an indus industry standard that helps us kind of do a checklist um, to ensure that our data is private and policies and procedures are in place you know, to ensure that data um, is kept safe um, from outside use. Great, thanks. Here's one that's actually was it's it's well it's actually directed toward me. Uh, the the question is does does GLHC provide marketing materials or other resources uh, to help us being uh, practices um, as outpatient clinical care providers. Um, uh, physician groups or other referral sources and uh, to join and to use GLHC and the answer to that question is yes. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard it referenced a couple of times in different breakout sessions earlier today uh, referring folks back to our website so there's a wealth of opportunity there in terms of resources, um, collateral, all of those kinds of things. One of the things that we do do however that uh, that is not necessarily as well known is that um, uh, the, the marketing team, which really consists of Emma Lilly and myself, um, will regularly partner with practices uh, to create custom materials uh, if that's something that is helpful to you. And the best way to go about doing that is uh, you can certainly uh, reach out to me directly or go to your uh, implementation consultant and, um, and ask them about how, uh, what the best way is to get something like that done. They'll in turn get it, get in touch with me. We can co-brand materials. We have, as I said, a wealth of existing um, collateral materials that uh, that are in place today, and um, and we're very willing to do whatever we can to help 
build your network of connected communities um, wherever you happen to be practicing. So um, I encourage you to reach out to us and let us know how we can help. Just something to add, Brian. Um, one of the most powerful things in this journey that I think working with Steve from day one on some of the referral stuff that many of you folks I think are using, um, one of the biggest pieces I took away was our spiel, our marketing, our, hey, sign up for this, this is what it does, it's really cool. Not as, as effective as you talking to a, a group that's not on it, that you think needs it because of everything that's going on between both of you. Relationship. Um, and quite frankly, a lot of what we do, that relationship peer to peer or industry to industry or whatever, far more effective than us trying to reach out on your behalf. Um, I say that A, in itself, but B, um, tag teaming with this team, uh, the marketing perspective of putting documents together that have multilingos or whatever, logos, um, but also put something together. Um, we recently, one of the ICs, Brian Bullock is in here somewhere, and uh, he and I went down to Monroe and met with the CMH down there. And the CMH said, I want to get a group of people in the room. I want them to be offices. I want them to be primary, specialists. I want people from Ohio here. They came up with that idea. To me, that is effective. Talking about that patient at the end of the day, getting looked after. Didn't expect that when we showed up. But in terms of that mind of let's try to do something together, mm -hmm. um, or even branding on your own that you may need some support in. It's just really effective. And we're not going to let that go just yet because as in the role of uh, community engagement, the implementation consultants, all of whom are here today, uh, are located throughout the state and they can work with you as a PO, they can work with you as a practice. We have materials that you as a practice could send to your peer group and say, hey, we're on this, we're on this platform, we'd really like to see you on this platform as well. It will expedite our relationship and do better transitions of care for our patients. We can provide that documentation to you as a practice. We can also do it to you uh, as a PO, so as an organization. And we can also co-brand with you. As, as Brian mentioned, we have a partner on the east side of the state, took our materials and surprised us with the quality of what uh, a one-page document that they are distributing in order to link behavioral health with primary care because uh, that is their passion and that's their market. They are a behavioral health organization and they want the primary care to join them in the referral network. So yes, we're happy to help you and we have tools that can get you started. We have people that can work with you and we're happy to see you go on this journey with us. Great, thanks. That uh, for those of us who are, uh, who are customer facing, <laughs> we get uh, uh, the privilege of spending a lot of time one-on-one uh, -on -one with you. Um, Many, and I've heard a couple of these comments today, many of you uh, know us by a voice over the phone or by the conference call that you happen to be on and updating things. Um, many of our solution specialists and project managers um, work uh, largely over the phone uh, with our clients. And so uh, it's a, this is a terrific opportunity for us to, to be um, face to face. Adam is one of those people as our, as our manager of, of, um, of project management. And um, Adam, uh, uh, the question that was raised is, is um, what kinds of new initiatives or, or um, uh, uh, projects are, are G is GLHC undertaking uh, that you think are particularly compelling for enhancing uh, the quality of care in Michigan? Yeah. Um, one thing that we've done over the last couple of years is immunization history, and that's getting you know the immunization sent up to the state of Michigan. Um, great opportunity, so some efficiencies there but it wasn't really anything in it for the offices. What we're coming about now is the immunization query, is having that, the data's all up there now, and now offices and hospitals can now query the data and get it back natively in their EMR so they can know what, you know, what, what data's been done for the patient, what's already been done, what's, what's forecasted for immunizations. So that is one of the solutions that's, that's really just starting to take off um, that is a big win, I think, for, for offices and for the end user, and just a lot of time savings and a lot of that good quality data right in their hands that's useful. Awesome, thank you. Getting through here. Hey, I'm gonna throw one in here. You want to talk about single sign-on and where we have that and kind of how uh, mm -hmm. that is helping the overall flow and in getting into you know, the Viper record. Yeah, um, single sign-on. So we have the Viper tool and that's a great opportunity for someone they can 
if they don't have an EMR, they can log into it. Uh, but really our goal is that they allow them to natively get into, from their EMR, uh, pull the information out of Viper. And single sign-on allows you within your Epic, within your Cerner, within your other EMR system, to when you're already looking at a patient, to then pull the data from Viper without having to go to a secondary system and log in um, and pull that data. So it's, it's using that, it's using that, the demographics in that patient, the kind of queries Viper, pulls the information back so it's natively viewable within your EMR. So that's, you know, you always hear about penalty clicks for physicians. It's saving physicians and other clinicians a lot of penalty clicks because um, the data is, you know, viewable right in their EMR. Many of you uh, may or may not be aware that most of us on staff at GLHC come from a variety of different backgrounds, but largely from healthcare backgrounds in one way or another. Um, uh, Steve Speaker, who manages our solution support team, is, um, is a social worker by training and spent many years uh, working on the acute uh, care side of the business is in social work. Um, Steve, could you, could you give us your perspective? Uh, he's also one of, the, uh, one of the very early staff team members, so n number five or six or something like that. Um, uh, from your care coordination perspective, uh, if, could you speak to the solutions that you have found particularly recently um, that are most significantly contributing to, uh, to the quality of care, to helping advance quality of care in Michigan? Um, what do you think that those things would be? Um, a couple of them. One is uh, with the referral application. Um, uh, many of you out there uh, are currently using. Um, that's been going on for now actually five and a half years, but it still continues to grow and make a significant impact. Um, many that I talk with when, you know, um, have said we can't live without that now within, you know, the way it's in our workflow. Um, but just one example along that line, and this was a few years ago, but it still impacts today. I was in Port Huron at a, um, an ENT specialist, and as I was talking with them about it, you know, just my mindset at that point was within their community, and they said, oh, you have ENT consultants in Grand Rapids? It's like, yes, they're on there, and they go, well, we make, we make referrals um, to Grand Rapids because of a specific specialist. So to realize that that referral application is truly statewide, but it's grown more than just from primary care to specialty. Um, we now have food banks on there. You know, we have different health agencies. So it's really one of those as you think about within your own community of any time when you're having to transfer that information. It's not just a referral, but it's a way of sharing that information without phoning or faxing. Um, to be able to utilize it, it continues to grow. Um, we now have over 1,200 sites throughout the state that are utilizing it. And it's you folks, not us, that have made over 109,000 referrals this year alone. Um, so it, it's phenomenal when you think about it. It's over 58 counties as well. Um, so that one, I think, from a community perspective on being able to share, even with behavioral health to medical, I know that there's the, you know, all the CFR 42 and all that fun stuff we have to deal with, but yet it's still a way to be able to find ways to share that information is amazing. Um, the other one too, I think that, and again, from an ER social work perspective, um, that aspect of what <coughs> Viper can do um, is an amazing, incredible tool. I just wish it was there when I was in the ER. Thank you, they had to wait till I quit, and then we decided to get it out there. Uh, but it's a phenomenal tool, um, as you know, Dr. Poland was saying, that is, to me, um, can make a, just a valuable asset to, to any practice, any hospital, instead of having to request those records back and forth. And just in follow-up, now my personal background prior to getting into uh, health technology was in uh, residential senior living, long-term care, post-acute, uh, basically all of those geriatric services. Um, uh, Steve, one of the things that, that folks might not know as much about uh, that one of the things that GLHC is doing is I wonder if you could speak to the patient care documents initiative that you really head up and, um, and tell us a little bit more about that as well. So with Viper, um, a couple years ago as we were looking at having all that medical information into one place, 
um, we began to realize that if you're going to go out and view that information, again, from an ER social work perspective, but broader than that, um, to have those patients at that time of need have their advanced care directive instead of in their glove compartment, you know, in the lockbox, in their freezer, you know, with a relative somewhere else, to have that sit alongside that medical record at that moment, at that time of need, um, is very powerful. Um, just real quick, another story that I hope I never hear again um, is that there was a, just recently, um, a patient was at a, um, a, one of the hospitals unconscious and they knew they had an advanced care directive. It was at another hospital. When they asked the hospital for that information, and I, I get it with HIPAA, I understand it, but they couldn't release that because the patient couldn't sign. Well, they're unconscious, you know? It's like, come on. And, I, and again, I get it, but if that advanced care directive had been sitting in Viper instead, that patient's wishes could be honored and they would have that information right then and there. So we um, developed, we worked with a developer to um, have a way of, it's really, it's a simple two-step process through a web um, portal of being able to add patient demographic information and upload that advanced care directive, um, you know, durable power of attorney even, uh, living will, organ donation, DNR, any of those documents that are important for that patient um, to have those sit alongside the record. Um, we then had a pediatrician who's very passionate about her um, asthma kids. And she said, if you're gonna do that, then I want my action plans. I want my asthma action plans there so when they show up in that ER, um, they know what our wishes, our plan is. So we expanded it to also include asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular. So any of those action plans that you have um, in your offices or care plans, those also can then sit along that record instead of you know, other medical professionals or the hospitals not knowing those wishes or knowing those care plans, et cetera, those sit alongside the record as well. There's no cost for it. It's, an, it's a great community service. Um, but really on those, if you have those advanced care directives sitting um, in your records, um, please let us know. We'd love to have those get uploaded as well. Thanks, Steve. Chris, we've spent a lot of time today talking about acute care and ambulatory care, primary and specialty. Um, the, uh, kind of uh, springboarding off of Steve's comments just then, this is gonna be the most poorly rehearsed hint uh, in the history of the world, but can you tell us a little bit about some of the exciting business opportunities that we have in terms of growing our range of services across the continuum of care? So what do you wanna know? <laughs> so, you know, Adam spoke a little bit to some of the opportunities and some of the new things. Um, we're really diving into um, the uh, skilled nursing, home health, uh, assisted living industry. Uh, we're really trying to, there are going to be a lot of tasks of delivering information to the state for these groups. Uh, we've been um, engaged with um, Leading Age of Michigan and working with them specifically on how can we get their customers, um, what's the great word, implemented, if you will. But all these other conversations we've had about relationship, about actually talking and consulting, one of the things I love best about Doug is when you go see someone or talk to someone, whether it's a hospital, doctor's office, community program, uh, CMH, listen first. And I think that's our key and, and um, first and foremost thing that we do best and that we really need to do more of anyways. So in answering your question, when it comes to some of the things we've done traditionally well, the referrals application, there are things we would like to internally uplift on that application to help that user. Um, because we all know that sometimes the cloud is a little bit easier than having to host things or have to be dependent on my IT service uh, vendor, which is good, but some things that you know, we can enhance for you. So I know that there's plans for some of those types of things. Um, our Viper application, getting it into the EMRs. Getting immunizations back, so the immunization query is definitely one of the biggest things we really want folks. You live in your EMR, so we want to keep you there as much as possible. Um, in terms of other things we have, like we mentioned the skilled nursing home health, being able to report the MDS for the skilled nursing and being able to deliver the OASIS for the home health to the state of Michigan so the money can get back to those folks 
because there's a lot of change in moving parts for that industry right now. Um, I mentioned earlier it's a lot easier when one group talks to another group instead of asking us to talk to them for them. When it comes to an uh, organization like Leading Age that has a membership already there, Mary mentioned POs and PHOs and different types of things like that. It's very helpful to partner with groups like that so we can help get stuff done faster because there aren't a lot of us on this team. Uh, and there's a lot more work than we are all in this room even comprehending. When, kind of all over the place. but That's good. One other thing along that line is a lot of those new areas that we go into aren't because we just are so creative and come up with these wonderful ideas. We get those from you folks. Mm -hmm. um, so again, and I've shared this with others, but those dumb ideas that you have, it's like, oh, they wouldn't want to hear about that. That's kind of a dumb idea. You have no idea um, how that may be sparking another thought or even that idea in of itself that you may think is dumb may be incredible um, that we can then partner with others as well. So um, it's, it's really one of those, it's because again, we're that community service for you. Um, we want to serve you on that and come up with those ideas and partner together. So it, it's our community together. Um, so please, um, as you're thinking about, oh, you know what, maybe we could connect this way or maybe this idea, um, we welcome those ideas because that's where we can all grow together and come up with new and creative ideas too. Yeah, one thing that we really try to focus on is meeting you where you're at. Um, you know, we have solutions that we've already built, but sometimes you get into your environment like, you know what, that solution doesn't quite fit for me. I need to do it this way. Can we do it that way? And we really pride ourselves on meeting you right where you're at, saying how do we customize this to fit in your office or to fit your need and not make you say, well, we have our solution. You have to fit it. Um, that is not our philosophy at all. Our philosophy is we have, we have solutions and we have knowledge here. How do we make the community work better? And that's, that's always our approach when we uh, work with customers. Just going to note a couple uh, relationships quick because we, tr we try to anticipate as well. So point click care is a vendor out there that's used in the post acute space uh, a lot. Uh, rather than going one on one, we've had uh, conversations with point click care, have a relationship now to build one interface into their hub platform to make it easier for organizations in that space to onboard. In the community mental health area where we've got a number of CMHs around uh, the state that are working with us, uh, PCE Systems is a big player um, in, in that space. And so we've built uh, connectivity. In fact, Washtenaw um, over in that part of the state has single sign-on from PCE Systems directly into Viper to pull that record back, as well as other things that we're doing with Jeff and his team over at, at PCE, because um, it's better to do it once than do it one time, you know, kind of for everybody. So those are a couple as we're exploring moving into some of these um, uh, areas that maybe we haven't been as heavily engaged in before. One of the ways we're trying to do that is figure out who the major technology players are and how can we kind of build stuff once that should lower the cost for all of you guys as well, because they're your vendors not having to uh, do it 15 times. They can just do it, you know, once. Thanks, Doug. So we've got just a few minutes left here, and uh, you all have been listening very attentively to, these, to the prepared questions. I want to give you all the opportunity to, um, uh, to put us on the spot a little bit. I, I would like to ask a question of the room, and that is, what is it, what do you think that we're doing well? And what kind of feedback would you like us to have in terms of things that we could or should be doing better for you? That's really... Uh, the point of our being together today is to learn as much from you all, uh, the community that we hope to serve, as, as, um, uh, as, as we do deliver solutions. Uh, so uh, Emma Lilly's going to come around with microphones. Is there anybody who has a, has a question, something that they would like to address to the, to the panel? Come on, something hard. Do you want everybody to jump at once? Mm -hmm. Something really hard. Something really hard for Chris or Mary would be great. <laughs> Social worker. <laughs> All right. While we're making our way, I will. I'll. I'll lob out one other question while we're while we're finding our next, and that is to to um, Mary. I know that you're very excited. A few months ago, many of you may be aware that Great Lakes Health Connect made a significant commitment uh, to the to the community of Flint in response to the water crisis. And that's something that we've been working actively on over the last couple of months. 
Um, Mayor, would you be willing to just give us a, an update about uh, where we're at and the status of, uh, of our Flint project? Sure. I'm happy to announce and introduce, actually, Kate, uh, Katrina Khoury, who's in the back of the room. She joined our team recently and just last month, and she is getting up to speed very quickly. She's a Flint native. She lives in Flint. She's worked in Flint, and she has amazing relationships. Every time we go to a meeting together, they hug her. So I did a good job on hire and finding her and, hi and hiring her, and now she can take the ball and run with it. We've already got re uh, relationships with, I have three hospitals there, and Greg Cavanaugh had been um, working that area prior to that and worked with the ACO. So we're going to be transitioning the relationships and making sure that Katrina can take that forward as we talk to the Community Foundation, the Greater Flint Health Coalition, the United Way, and all of the other social determinants of health. Because in addition to being able to get the information from the facilities, critically, most critically, lab results so that we know when these kids have had a, an elevated lab, lead lab level. Um, we want to be, make sure that they can get that back to the primary care, but also, no matter where those kids go, they would be able to be on the Viper tool. So they can see that lead level if they got it from Hurley and they happen to be in McLaren Doc, or if they're going to a Genesis facility and they're in the um, GGC ACO. Now that's a lot of initials. Um, so that we're passionate about providing those solutions, but we're also really intent on listening to them. And one of the things we learned just last week, because we were sort of oriented towards the kiddos and thinking, okay, it's, it's about the kids, it's about the pregnant women. They said, mm, we're actually now really getting aware of and being more concerned about the older population as well. Because as lead has an impact on older folks, it's going to have an impact on their cognition. And they, want, they regard that as a vulnerable, vulnerable population. So we're going to be talking to internal med docs as well as peds and family practice and OB-GYNs. Um, and Flint is all in on this. They're really appreciated, appreciative of the health. I think that they're just coming off the wave of being overwhelmed. And now they're kind of going, okay, what's the next best step? What do we do now? And we're there to help them figure that out from the physical health and health information exchange point of view. Let me, let me throw in two cents too, because Flint is one of those things, and it was referenced this morning, I just want to tie it back again, um, that should be a lesson for all the communities. The stuff that we're doing there to figure out for kids that have these physical needs certainly, but then the behavioral things that happen with lead you know, poisoning and, and the other cognitive and other, other stuff that in, gets into the schools and, and the other environments. Um, what you heard from Dr. Poland just a little bit ago is the exact same thing is happening for, for patients here. It's the stuff we have to do. The unfortunate thing about things like uh, Flint is it's the reminder to a community is the what for. You know, why do we, why do we have to, to do it? It's when we run smack into one of those that it goes, oh, that's why we have to do this stuff. That's, that's why we need it. And we're hardwired as human beings to kind of run into the wall <laughs> before, we, the, before we see it. So um, a lot of the things that we're doing there, kind of post-mortem to say, okay, how do we put the right infrastructure in place so that we can take care of what we see today and also understand what's a future public health model look like so we're maybe not as dependent on some of the old things as we used to so that these things don't slip by us you know, quite so easily is the exact same thing that we're trying to do here absent kind of the specific what for. Um, that, um, that, that happened out there. So it's all really you know, tied together and as those kids move or those individuals beyond the kids move from Flint to West Michigan and start moving around as everybody is apt to do, the fact that it's all integrated into the same platform and the information can be shared is just gonna make it that much better as, as, as they traverse uh, and folks here uh, that way as well. Yeah, I'll piggyback that and just the question Brian asked about the skilled nursing and uh, home health. The frail patient is lost as well. And so a lot of the different um, initiatives to help track those patients when they go to and from in an ambulance with a folder of information that may make it with them or not. Um, getting that information from that skilled nursing facility, from that home health group that says, all right, I'm going to go into there for vibrance, just not hospital stuff. It's also doctor office stuff. It's also skilled nursing information. It's all in one place. 
um, it's not a holy grail anymore, which is great because it's actually practical usage and practical use cases. And Doug and the boss who's either on vacation or at the conference, um, he always says, we're not going to do it if there's no value to it. And the only way we truly know there's value to it is from here. And we got perceptions. We have some experience, some social workers. and. Um, but I think honestly, when it comes down to the benefits of those patients, whether the peds, whether it's the, the frail patient that can't advocate, they can't go to the vet down in Battle Creek because the spouse can't get them there and back. I mean, those are the things that really matter. Last chance, questions? Here's one. Yeah. Well, first of all, I love Great Lakes Health Connect. As far as the, uh, the referral aspect of it, it's made my job so much easier. Um, I'm just wondering, when it comes to uh, Viper, are patients able to obtain their records that are entered into Viper, or do they have to go to each uh, individual uh, hospital or office that they've been to to get those? Yeah, we've just had a pretty uh, deep review of our business associate agreements that we signed, because we uh, operate on behalf of the covered entities that give us the data, so we're their business associate. And the way, not just ours, but most in the industry have been written to this point, if a patient comes to a business associate or comes to us and says, I want to see the data that's in the exchange, we have to send them back to the covered entity because we don't have permission per the agreements today to make that data available. Now, there's many reasons why, as things have evolved over the last five or six years that maybe that doesn't make sense. Um, patients who maybe want to send data to their own personal health record uh, so they can have the stuff there. Uh, patients who maybe uh, sign up for a particular trial and, and need their clinical information sent to the folks that are administering that trial, going back and talking to every of 15 providers, you know, to build and some of that stuff doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. So we actually have a um, uh, process underway right now to go back to our uh, participants uh, to see if we can't get them amended uh, to say that if a patient comes and signs a consent that they want their data released in some way, that that is something we'd be able to do on behalf of the participants rather than sending them back. I imagine we'll have some very interesting conversations with uh, some of the compliance folks um, in that. Um, but that's where it is. So, and I'll, I'll just touch on a couple other things related to patients in case it's a, it's a question um, for others. We still have not gone directly to the patients and tried to establish relationships with individual consumers themselves. Um, because we believe that does a couple things. I, you know, I'll say I'll believe it does a couple things. Um, one, it puts us in front of you who are caring for them. I don't know why a person would have to care that we exist, frankly. Our job <laughs> is to enable the clinicians in the community to provide the type of experience we want every person to have relative to uh, facilitating their health and wellness and care. And so whatever we can provide from a data service, whatever standpoint that makes that better, that's what we want. So we don't have a personal health record. We're not going out and trying to approach those folks because I don't want to try and draw their eyes to me when they should be focusing their eyes on, you know, kind of all of you. Um, uh, however, as a conduit, as there are more of those PHRs that are unfolding, we may need to be a, a relay where we're sending data through us from our, um, from our participants. And so that's what we are um, keeping our eyes open for. That get all of what you're wanting to know? Okay. Any last ones? I thought someone had a question in the back. This may be naive or premature, but I'm struggling to um, uh, learn what's going to be required on, on in the new macros and the CPC plus platforms for primary care. And one of the things they're talking about is risk stratification. Mm -hmm. And I can figure out how we might do that within our own EMR. There's some functionality there. I'm wondering if that's something that 
is on your horizon at all or bigger than at the EMR level? Does that make sense to anybody? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, I, I think from my standpoint, the details as to what all that means are equally blurry. But what I've tried to boil things down, even in this health information exchange world and where things were going, I, I don't know. Every time I've put a year plan together, the only thing that's been 100 percent true is that I've been wrong at kind of where things ended up, because it's just hard to project and understand that stuff. But there are base principles that we know, regardless of what it specifically looks like, there are certain things that have to be in place. One of them is we're going to have to be able to get the data out of the EMRs um, and have it ready so that we can do measurements based on value and quality and those sorts of things. Um, we also know regardless of what the specific details are, that we're going to have to do that reporting uh, with data that doesn't exist in my system. So if I have an EMR, um, when we're in an ACO relationship, we're in a clinically integrated network relationship um, with the SIM you know, thing that's coming and, and all of that, that, that's all geared toward bringing folks that are on different systems and platforms together. There is no question that the quality measurement reporting we're going to have to do is going to have to be beyond what any particular electronic system has. <laughs> Specifically, what that is, we'll find out. So we're, what I'm trying to focus us on is being able to do those two core things very well. Get the data out. Get the data out in a way that makes as much of it reportable as we possibly can and do it in a way that as we bring data from multiple systems that we can sit those, that data side by side with each other and, and do common sets of reporting across. I think if we do that, we'll have the base for whatever the specifics turn out to be. Um, and I think that as the uh, clinical community, the, the same is true for some of the other solutions we have, even the use of Viper. The way the clinical teams are being organized, the way the business is being done are changing so much. Technically, we tend to be very good at when there's a clear business, we can put technology underneath it and make it hum. When there's blurry business and we put technology at it, we just make a really technically blurry thing. <laughs> we can't solve the, the blurriness there. So I think with MacroMIP, some of these other sorts of models, payment models that are coming out, we're kind of hoping that the business environment starts to crystallize a little bit, which gives us better understanding of exactly how we need to engage it. But like I said, regardless, getting the data out, normalizing it in a way that we can sit it side by side and do uh, reporting is something that we're focused on. I'm going to have to let that one be the last one. We're just a little bit over time, but uh, we, we've been doing a really pretty good job of sticking to uh, the schedule so far today. So. Um, I will adjourn you momentarily to the afternoon breakout sessions, and, and if you all don't mind, I'll give those speakers the latitude to take a little uh, extra 10 minutes or so so that they can fit their content into their presentations. Um, before I do that, I want to thank my, uh, my colleagues for, uh, the, for the, uh, their willingness to sort of be uh, on the firing line here, and uh, as well as all of those colleagues who put a lot of uh, effort in, and um, uh, work over the last several months into putting session presentations together. And then most specifically, there's a group of, of uh, folks who put, started about literally eight months ago putting the Summit Series programs together. This is our second of what will ultimately be four of these types of, of um, presentations across the state. Um, and so uh, Mary and Steve and Chris, who you have all met, uh, and myself sat on a committee and then um, um, where's Emma Lilly? I'm going to make her stand up again. So there's Emma Lilly in the back of the room. So she is standing. When you <laughs> stand up, Emma Lilly. <laughs> so those people who know me know that I, I have a tendency to be big picture, but the whole detail thing is sort of lost on me. So 90% of the heavy lifting that happens to get something like this done happens because Emma Lilly is doing what she does. So I want to thank you all for being with us and thank, uh, thank my colleagues for helping us put the curriculum and the program together as well. Uh, Jordan. You're off. Go free. <laughs>